Masam Buddhasa Dhammo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sammasam Buddhasa Dhammo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sammasam Buddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So I'm always wary of newcomers uh, who come and sort of see all our ritual and our chanting and our strange poly and are a bit put off or perhaps confused. And what I remember is talking to a monk in England who was born in Japan. And he said when he came to Europe, it felt wrong because you'd go to a mountaintop and where in Japan you'd have a shrine, a Shinto shrine or a Buddhist shrine or something, in, in Europe there would be nothing. Uh, the original kind of worship of the landscape had been forgotten and uh, crushed by history. And this idea that where he came from, um, everything was made sacred and so much of what we do with ritual and uh, adding gravity to normal things, um, uh, a teaching, a dhamma talk, to committing to precepts which perhaps we keep anyways, but to formalize them, to bring them into the heart, to sit together in a space which is framed by pillars and light and stained glass. When we surround something with intention and intentional structure, we give it weight and make it sacred and valuable in a new way. And this is, in Buddhist thought, deeply related to the idea of of gratitude. Because when we lend weight again, bring mindfulness to experience and acknowledge it as fleeting and sacred and a sacred chance to practice, then it becomes something deeply precious and worthy of gratitude. So there's a story of uh, Ajahn Jayasaro was, uh, before a monk, he traveled through Europe and India and uh, Afghanistan, seeing if he could get by with no money. So I think he lost his passport after a few months and uh, slept, rolled up in a rug going over the mountain passes of Afghanistan. And eventually after losing his passport, um, he ended up in Tehran and was sort of wandering around, sort of dirty in the street, and this woman approached him, and she didn't speak any English, but she motioned him uh, up to her apartment and uh, gave, like, invited him to take a shower and brought him a bunch of new clothes and made him a meal, and then just quietly, without them having really understood a single word from each other, ushered him back uh, onto his journey. And he just recalls uh, crying afterwards because he realized that this same unbelievable act of kindness that he just experienced had been exactly what his parents had been doing for him every day, every year, for his entire life, and he'd never really thought about it. And it's this moment of understanding the gift, which is the mundane or seemingly mundane life which we so easily look over, um, that is the essence of gratitude and the essence of remembering something as sacred. They're interrelated. 
we lend weight to these day-to-day experiences, relationships, gifts, and they become something which uh, makes the heart uh, react or respond with a sense of deep, uh, deep gratitude. And when we look at what the Buddha told or encouraged us to lend, uh, lend weight to, to really recollect with gratitude, um, he gave us a list called the six objects of reverence, six things which we should hold with weight. They're called garu, uh, which means heavy. And this is uh, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, um, the training, heedfulness, and hospitality. And if you look at these different things in your life and where these uh, threads are, then the natural response is the sense of deep gratitude for all that we've been given. The sixth of hospitality, for example, is um, relevant in so many relationships of ours uh, for the parents that we have who have cared for us. And in Buddhism, that relationship is held with um, as one that's deeply sacred, uh, one where one should feel uh, immense indebtedness to one's parents, even if the relationship wasn't perfect, because so they, uh, they never are. But in a sense, the places in our life that are the most fraught are the ones that need to be framed as ever even more sacred for us to be able to hold them as a crucible in which true spiritual growth can occur. So in Thailand, uh, once a year at least, the, par- the children will come and wash the hands of their parents and ask for forgiveness. And uh, one can't go forth into the robes unless one has one's parents' permission. And it's considered this essential relationship. And because there's so many karmic forces working within the parent-child relationship, it's all the more reason to hold it as deeply sacred and to recollect that even in a difficult relationship, and this isn't to say that there's not parent-child relationships where one should gain a bit of distance or draw boundaries. But even then, the sense of gratitude and repaying one's parents is, is key. And if one orients like that and remembers the gift of one's life, of being taught, of at least being um, born, then this becomes one Uh, source of gratitude in in life. The other objects of reverence, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, um, it's meaningful to remember what a rare a rare occurrence it is in the world to come into contact with these teachings There's a sutta called Future Dangers where the Buddha speaks about um, how rare, how grateful, how rare it is and how grateful we should be for this uh, fact that we are now healthy enough to practice, that we uh, live in a society that's harmonious enough to hold these teachings, that, um, you know, that these teachings are still extant. And it's easy to become fixated on the suffering that we have in our lives and forget what it was like just a few years ago when we didn't have even this much uh, of a refuge, even that daily practice of sitting or even just the right view that we don't need to believe that our thoughts are us, that we don't need to identify completely with um, the five aggregates of clinging, the body, the personality, that we don't need to identify with these broken and breakable pieces, which if we tie our hearts to, then the, break, the heart breaks as well when they do. And uh, just this line of words at the end of Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination of 
suffering, sorrow, lamentation, and despair, just recollecting in one's life, is there a point where you can say that that word despair no longer really applies? Things still suck sometimes, there's still suffering, but is there a slight lightening over these years? And just recollecting what deep resources we have as practitioners that so many don't. And to recollect that this uh, thread of the teaching has not come to us easily. You read of stories of uh, monks and nuns enduring through famine or during the Maoist revolution. There's stories of the Maoist Red Guard trying to basically uh, beat the um, monks and nuns into disrobing so that they could take the monastery lands. And there's these tales of those renunciants just refusing to uh, give in and just repeating the name of the Buddha. And we come to these teachings and they're kind of interesting and novel and there's a nice little chanting book and it's sort of a, a thing we can do once a week and we forget that this is a thread that is run through history through the lives and deaths of so many through empires and it's come to us and what gratitude we can have for that. In essence, this aspect of gratitude is, begins with mindfulness, bringing awareness to our day-to-day -day lives and understanding that they are significant. Um, there's a teacher named Munindroji who was asked why he meditated and he said it's so that he could notice the small purple flowers on the side of the road on the way to the town square. And this idea that these small things in our lives are not small. Um, they're the cloth through which, uh, out of which we, we make this path. And if we orient towards being aware uh, through bringing mindfulness to our day-to-day -day actions, then things begin to glow and become infused with uh, a sanctity. It's an alchemy, um, alchemy of awareness, in that when we recollect the things we have to be grateful for, when we bring attention to the small goodnesses in our life, then we realize we exist in this field of love which holds the world together despite the headlines, despite the things we get wound up in. Uh, suffering takes attention and when something's in your eye, your entire world is, is the thing in your eye. But the world is bigger than that and to be able to widen awareness away from our suffering, which is what it clings to, and feel the whole scope of this broad, bright, place that we actually exist in. Uh, this is part of the path. And it's a, uh, a bit of a chicken and egg thing because when we bring awareness to our day-to-day -day life, we see it as sacred. But also we can use skillful means to, to sanctify our day-to-day -day life and therefore make it seem worthy of awareness. So this is why you create a space in your house for a shrine why you bow first thing in the morning and last thing in the evening, if you want, to a symbol of awakening or of your highest aspiration. Um, you're framing the day with sanctity. You're sanctifying it. And this is why so many of the good acts that we can do in a day are the things we're already doing, but just made a little more sacred. So uh, I use this example often. Instead of just taking the dried laundry out of the dryer, folding it, and bringing it up to the person's room. That's adding the little extra um, sanctity to it almost. Uh, to, you know, if you feel like you can take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, in this uh, aspiration of awakening, can you recommit to that on a daily basis or on a weekly basis? Can you frame your life in a way that makes you remember it is fleeting and precious and something to be grateful for? And this is one of the key aspects of anatta, uh, not self, in Buddhism, is that all the goodness in us we have learned, we have been given, and we are carrying it on, and we can amplify it, and yet it is a gift we have been given. 
all the good qualities we've learned, you can trace them back. And these aren't ours. They are a gift and they'll flow from us to us and then from us out into the world again. Um, you know, the two kind of key movements which align with the breath are inhale, gratitude, exhale, giving. And these are interrelated. When you begin to take in how much you have been given, you want to give it back. And you become a conduit for something much greater than your small self. And you can judge a bit of someone's practice by how easily this gratitude comes to them. Uh, there's, you know, you find that after a while of meditating, of cultivating the path, you just become very sensitive to seeing good acts in people around you. You know, you see someone give, and it, it almost brings to mind tears, um, or brings tears to the eyes. I remember sitting with a bunch of monks uh, at Wat Mopjun, where I ordained, and there was some sort of Hallmark commercial playing, and I looked around, and I think like 70% of the monks were kind of crying, but trying to keep it sort of under wraps and secret. So this does become something we become sensitive to, is the goodness. And then there's the other side, which is a lot of life isn't, doesn't seem like a blessing. Um, in Buddhism, there's two arrows of suffering. There's the first arrow of suffering, which is the natural fragility of life, the things that aren't as we wish them to be. And then there's the second arrow of suffering, which we shoot ourselves with, of wishing it were otherwise, of uh, turning the dislike or the of slight aversion into hatred, of becoming drunk on this or that emotion of craving. And that first arrow is there too. And one of the quintessential movements in Buddhism and in spiritual practice as a whole is having a structure and a teaching powerful enough that it helps you turn to those aspects as blessings on the path, as tools to help you grow. Because without that first arrow, without seeing the fragility of life, um, of these aspirations we attach to, then there'd be no reason to look beyond them. And in a sense, the world is falling apart in its eagerness to show us what lies underneath. So when we are given the Four Noble Truths of comprehending suffering, of letting go of its cause, craving, of realizing cessation, peace, of cultivating the path to peace, to understand that the Buddha places that first noble truth of turning towards suffering right at the front because it is so key to everything that changes life from a constant pursuit of pleasure and running away from pain, which is a never-ending game, to one where we look at everything as a blessing on the path, uh, where we have gratitude for all experience, whether it seems good or bad. And um, Han Shan, a famous Zen uh, poet, had a, uh, a saying where he said, look, after a while, practice becomes all pleasant. Because if experiences are pleasant, then they're pleasant. And if they're painful, it's a chance to use your Dharma strength, which is pleasant. So if we manage to turn towards those difficult things as chances to grow in patience and kindness, as, a ch as chances to become more humble, as a chance to grow in compassion, then they become something to be grateful for as well. Uh, Richard Rohr has said that, you know, up until you're 30, you need some success to build self-esteem. But after 30, everything he l he's learned has been from failure. And he pr has a prayer that once a day, um, God humbles him. And can we all pray for that? At least, you know, if we had a God, we could. But uh, you can still invite the world and the Dhamma to humble you. And when that happens, you feel the bruising and the letdown. But as you practice, you also begin to realize that after a while that moves through the body and it settles. 
and you come out with this humility and this quiet majesty in you and that's worth everything because these personalities and these careers and these lives don't become enlightened the chitta becomes enlightened the heart becomes enlightened and the personality and these lies we try to patch together will go their own way but if they're all used as an aspect of the path then it's all a blessing and it's all stepping stones um, there's a priest a monk Moira I think his name was and he uh, wrote a book called the saints of the prisons and it's about these group of monks who were put in the gulags uh, in the Soviet Union and they basically decided to use this time in prison as a chance to not just atone for their sins, but rather it was a moment of spiritual warfare for them to see how much they could purify themselves and how good, how honest they could remain. And he talks about coming in and meeting these men after seven, eight, nine years, and they were untouched and just bright. And in a sense, we don't have to conceive of this as spiritual warfare, but we are trying to cleanse the heart of greed, hatred, and delusion. And without dukkha, the first noble truth there, to help the knowing element separate out from this fragile reality it's become entangled in, without that there's if things are too good there's no reason for it to to become separate and sustained and bright on its own so turning towards all aspects of the path of gratitude um, as the first noble truth and leaning into them in that sense and yet i think one of the most difficult things is you know when things are really bad you can kind of bow to it and see how it can be something humbling. But what's so difficult is the more mundane suffering or discontent in our lives, the fact that things in our lives aren't aligning as quickly as we'd want them to with how we think they should go, how the job is a burden and just a little too much, how we're waiting for things to change and they're not the sort of slow boil, and that's less romantic. It's just a mundane level of suffering. And with this, it's really important to remember that the Buddha praised patient endurance as the supreme value in the heart. But that word doesn't do it justice because it implies this kind of gritting of the teeth. And uh, kanti comes from the same root as the Pali word kamati, which means forgiveness. It means forgiveness. And if you look at this impatient quality of like, why are things like this? Why am I like this? Why haven't they changed? There's this aspect of not forgiving yourself or the world for what it is. And this aspect of forgiveness involves this turning towards, of the heart towards experience, even the mundane difficult day-to-day -day, which is the essential it's the same turning of the heart which is gratitude it's just a little less romantic and a little less easy to put your finger on but it's equally as important so just to know that there's a a, a commentarial text called the questions to king melinda and king this king he's in Kashmir. he's asking this monk is it better to commit a sin, uh, a, um, an unwholesome action, knowingly or unknowingly? And the monk says it's better to commit it knowingly. And the king says, what, what are you talking about? And he says, look, it's like you're holding a glowing hot ball. It's better to know it's glowing hot because you'll drop it sooner than to be holding a glowing hot ball and not know because then it'll continue to burn you. And so often you come to this path, you taste the Dhamma, and suddenly you realize more and more how your life isn't aligned with it in the way that you wish it was. And just to, to understand that the kama you cultivate, the beauty in the heart through the practice of meditation, of morality, through these unbelievable, 
unbelievably profound teachings, it's such potent karma, and it shifts the heart radically so quickly that there's no way your external life can keep up right on the back, right, right in line with it. And there's inevitably this, this period where your heart's changed and you know you're holding a glowing hot ball, but you can't let it go yet. You have commitments, you have inertia, and even if your conscious mind knows you want to let go, something deep in your heart needs to burn for a little while before it actually is ready to let go. And that's inevitable. It's just part of this path. And just to have patience with that. You're doing okay. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. Nothing has to change right away. Things will change when they're ready. Your job is to practice carefully in a forgiving way with gratitude and trust that things will change when they're ready. And that takes forgiveness of yourself and of the place you are in your life. But instead of comparing yourself to this ideal person you'd like to be, think of what you were a year ago or two years ago and you didn't know you were holding a burning hot iron ball and you were fracturing yourself, perhaps. I know I was. And yes, now something's in you, in you is marshalling towards a greater purpose, but it takes a while. And just this is part of the whole process. And that same turning of the heart towards that and forgiveness is the exact same turning of the heart that occurs with gratitude. It's all, all the same. This entire path is about turning of the heart through mindfulness, through appreciation, and through loving kindness towards where we are, towards what we are, and um, we hold ourselves and each other through that, and it takes a while, but uh, eventually you find yourself seated in a vast space, even if it's only for a day, and you know you'll be back in the gym tomorrow, and you're with people you care about, and you can have faith that um, you'll come back here eventually. Antamayang tamakata ya satu pakarang kata masih satu 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 anu mutami. So maybe, um, should we do breakout groups or, um, let's do, let's do quiet breakout groups and maybe, um, just get into groups of three or four and if you feel inclined, then just talk about what in your life you know you should turn towards right now and remember is sacred and that could be something really beautiful that you're just not looking at as much as you should or it could be the difficult thing that you know you need to be holding as kind of the essence of of your path right now um, and just see what comes up with this theme of gratitude and turning towards what came up from the talk um, and we'll do that for about 10 minutes if you're on zoom then we'll break you out into breakout groups So cool. <laughs> okay. I think Joey can actually play the pipe organ. Joey, can't you? <laughs> right, good. So um, now if people just wanted to, we have a few minutes, bring up anything that came, came up during conversation that you'd like to share or any questions you have and just raise your hand and we'll get a mic over to you. Um, could someone be the mindful mic runner, Juanita, or someone, and uh, or Sai? And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand, and we'll call on you. Okay. Gary, yeah, over there. Yeah. 
That was a beautiful combination of the meditation and your talk. <clears throat> and I just briefly want to mention that I heard you direct some of that to parent and child relationship. But in all honesty, I have to say that immediately that conflict between the person that you love so much and that at some moments you hate immediately came to my marriage. And that's just speaking honestly about not only the struggle that it can be, but also the fact that it is the opportunity for things to break open and find the real value beneath. And I have those moments of struggle and I have those moments of deep, deep gratitude. Thank you for the, your presentation. I want to thank you as well. There's so much in that talk, really beautiful. Um, one thing that came up for me and others in our group was wanting to move further along in that path of gratitude and forgiveness with a parent, yet having a parent that was abusive or who harmed you on a regular basis as a young child or um, treated you with hatred. And so I understand it intellectually, but I feel like on a deeper level, I'm not moving forward and I want to in terms of forgiveness. Yeah, I'll be um, you know, curious if others have things to say on that as well. Um, I think some of it's also to you know, the Buddha said, if you can't cultivate loving kindness for someone, you can, uh, for a while, not bring them to mind. And this is a valid thing, is you, if, if you just can't bring someone to your mind without them really bringing up some negative states, then it's okay to write their name on a piece of paper and tuck it away for a few months and just say, I'm not going to think about them for now. What I take the encouragement to hold that relationship as sacred is that whenever there's an opening in your heart or in the relationship where you feel like actually I, I can I can feel a little meta here or I can reach out and you're like should I do it should I not like I feel like I actually have the bandwidth then you do um, there is a debt there no matter what of some kind and no matter how much no matter how much harm has been done and and I'm not saying that you know some people it's right to cut off completely you know absolutely and I'm not saying this is always easy. It's just, I think it's a helpful encouragement in those moments of, of wavering between like, I think I could actually reach out right now. And should I? And it's sort of like, this is a, a, an encouragement. Like, it's worth, it's worth reaching out if there's a chance, even just if in your own heart, if nothing else. Um, but if you have anything else around it, I would also, I don't have great experience, or I don't have a lot of experience with this, so. Well, in our small group, one thing, just from hearing everyone talk in the group, I, I realized, oh, I'm, one thing I'm grateful for is breaking the cycle. Yeah, and, and there's also this fact, I mean, I think we all know this experience, it's the beauty of uh, seeing conditionality is when you understand what made your parent like they, like they were, their childhood, etc. you understand. There's that release in the heart, like, oh, of, of course, of course, and... I'm not saying that's easy to come to, but uh, yeah, breaking the cycle. Those sankaras have sometimes been with us through generations, you know, so yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm a little hesitant to, I feel um, maybe compelled to offer a little I have some Please. experience um, as well with um, that, you know, trying to figure out how to hold um, in this way the difficult relationships with parents or ancestors. And 
Um, one thing, you know, as, as, as I've moved along the practice, and, and you touched on this, um, Ajahn, in your talk, the just being grateful for the gift of this life. You know, like when I think about how much I love this life and the things that I've learned, um, even with a parent that I have no connection with or um, really difficult feelings toward, like I'm so grateful that I get to be alive. And when I think about where I have come like to this place sitting in this space with you beautiful people and and how I found the the Dhamma and all the ways that I've grown which I could never have imagined I feel such gratitude and for nothing else that I get this opportunity I feel tremendous gratitude and then you know in this tradition, there's this, like, you always hear people talk about your ancestors and honoring your ancestors and all of that connection, and I, I could never relate to it. I come from, like, two lineages of very difficult, damaged, you know, people, like, from all sides, and I could just never connect to it, and I felt so sort of rootless for so long. And how I've come to hold it now is that each path, I, each step I take along the path is, you know, like I was able to connect to it sort of universally, like in a bodhisattva way, like for the benefit of all beings, right? But the only way I can work with that sort of ancestor idea is that each step I take with intention, with, um, you know, with a pure heart, with, with you know, I'm also offering that purification to the whole lineage of ancestors that I come from, to all of that damage, like what you were saying of breaking the cycle. For me, it's like each step is a purification that I'm offering to all of the conditions that came before me of those specific people. And, and I can hold it with a lot of um, beauty now when I think about it in that way, it's not this sort of personal entanglement, but like, like I really am offering this for all that damage that you did, right? And, and that has been perpetrated for generations. Like, it just feels really beautiful. Um, anyway, that's rough stuff, though. Like, it's really hard to hold that. Um, yeah. Thank you, Kim. I think we have time for one more. Hi. Um, I don't know necessarily how this question is going to come out. I'm having a little bit of a hard time articulating what question is coming to mind. Um, but what is coming up for me, uh, I shared with a mentor this week, you know, we were exploring suffering um, and, you know, there was just a lot, uh, you know, a lot of dissatisfaction. It's been a really challenging year and, you know, for reasons that are just normal life things, you know, it's been a while since I've been able to be here. And throughout, you know, the whole talk, I'm like crying and not necessarily because of the pain a little bit but more of just like a gratitude and like a sense of like I've been lost out in the wilderness and like I felt like I just like okay I'm home like ah, like relief and there's a sense of you know like I know I'm gonna like step back out in the world and you know a level of what you were saying humility of like wow I you know thought on some level that like I wouldn't stray so far from the path, and not that I'm super far, but um, I have a fear around forgetting because I forget a lot. And, you know, I've had moments over the past couple of weeks where I'm like, ah, I remember, I remember how important this is, and then like, whew, it goes away. And so, um, <laughs> 
I don't know really what the question is, but if you could, I don't know, maybe offer something for that. Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, just to quickly backtrack a little, there's, there's a quote that's coming to mind, which is that if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. So <laughs> just for those who have trouble with the parents, I think you're, you know, we're all, mom, dad, you're great. But uh, <laughs> it's like in general. Um, as to that, Bree, I, I think the uh, chicken and egg thing is uh, relevant here in that it's one thing to talk about bringing awareness and therefore sanctifying life and remembering its value and importance of the practice, but there's also this aspect of really, uh, you know, making a calculated and clear effort to use external skillful means to remember the sacredness of it and to give yourself these touchstones throughout the day and the week so that you don't forget because you're right it's it's really forgettable um, so I think that's the importance of building in um, a Sabbath day like one day a week where you hold eight precepts if you can um, just after noon you you know maybe you don't eat except for a bit of sugar to keep your mind bright or you can that's not essential but turn off the uh, turn off the phone um, make a day of practice once every week or once every two weeks if that's the best. Um, remember that way, uh, trying to make a habit of once every month or once every two months going to, uh, you know, or maybe in your life it's once every four months going to a monastery if you can and, and touching in for a few days. Servasti Abbey is only uh, in the east side of the states, only four hour drive away. It's doable for a lot of people. Um, and uh, structuring these other things in your life. But I think that kind of weekly or bi-weekly check-in, like monks and nuns have that. Every two weeks we gather, we confess uh, what we feel like we've done that hasn't been quite in line with our values, and then we reaffirm our shared code. And just to have that built in um, as like a very regular touchstone, and just one day a week where you get to go on a walk and step away from conditions for an afternoon, because if you never step out of the water, you don't know how far you've been swept. You know, you need, you need a reference point that's established clearly every few weeks or every few days if you can. So, yeah, that's, yeah. You, Saturday gatherings are great, but they're not always here either. So, <laughs> okay. Um, we, should, we should wrap things up. Um, so, uh, I think let's begin perhaps by reading the chanting request list.